Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Patrick Corrigan, who is a distinguished professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology and a leading expert on the topic of stigma. Dr. Corrigan has written more than 400 peer-reviewed journal articles, is editor emeritus of the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation, and editor of Stigma and Health, a new journal published by the American Psychological Association. Dr. Corrigan is the author of many books, including The Stigma Effect, Unintended Consequences of Mental Health Campaigns, The Stigma of Disease and Disability, Understanding Causes and Overcoming Injustices, and is part of the team that developed the Honest, Open, Proud series, which aims to reduce the stigma of mental illness. Dr. Corgan, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you for having me. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research on the topic of stigma and mental health? Well, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist by trade, working for about 30 years. A large part of that work has been addressing the needs of people with serious mental illness mostly trying to help them reach their recovery goals, get back to work, live independently, develop relationships. And I discovered about 20 years ago that one of the big barriers to accomplishing these goals is stigma, not the disease and disabilities that limit the person, but the stigma that limit the community and block these people from reaching their goals. Um, In a parallel sense, I'm also a person with serious mental illness. I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, major depression, generalized anxiety disorder. I know the feeling of being put on a locked unit for a one-week stay, knowing what it's like to stand in line for that one phone on the wall to call my wife and tell her I wasn't going to be at my daughter Elizabeth's school function that night took my medications this morning. And so stigma is not an abstraction for me. It's, it's a real concern and one I use my research abilities, good idea of how to fix it. That's an incredible story. How would you define stigma as it relates to someone with mental illness? Why is stigma a barrier to accessing quality mental health treatment? Stigma of mental illness falls in the same category as racism, sexism, and ageism. And those are all defined by stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. So let me give you a, one example of the stigma about a group I know well, which is Irish Americans. The stereotypes about Irish Americans is that we're all drunks and neglect our family. The prejudice is agreeing with the stereotype. Yep, that's right. They're all drunks leading to an emotional reaction, therefore I dislike them. And discrimination is the behavior. Discrimination is I don't want to be their friends or be around them or hire them. We're, of course, much more interested in the stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination of mental illness. Stereotypes of mental illness, the big one is that we're all dangerous because we believe we're dangerous. You're not going to want to hire us. You might look good. You could flip out any minute and hurt someone. Other stereotypes is that they're weak and they chose to have this kind of thing. They're incompetent. Prejudice, again, is agreeing with the stereotype, leading to two big emotional reactions. One is fear. I'm afraid of people with mental illness. The other is shame. They should be ashamed of themselves, leading to discriminatory behaviors. We can understand this group discriminatory behaviors when you understand that there are different types of stigma. Public stigma is what we, the public, do to people with serious mental illness when we agree with the stereotypes. So there's clear evidence that employers won't hire people with mental illness or provide them the kind of reasonable accommodations that are guaranteed in the American with Disabilities Act or landlords won't rent to them, or education systems won't provide the appropriate accommodations or do, or healthcare providers offer substandard of care. And so each of those cases, people with mental illness suffer discrimination and undermine their goals in life. Second kind of stigma is self-stigma. What happens when you live in a society that endorses these kind of stereotypes? You have a mental illness yourself and you internalize it. Yep, I must be a weak person or an incompetent person, leading to decreasing my sense of self-esteem or my sense of self-efficacy and what we call the why try effect. Why should I try to get a job? Something like me is not worth it. Or why should I try to live independently? Something like me is not able The third kind of stigma addresses your issue of how it undermines care-seeking. Fundamentally, stigma is a mark. Irving Goffman, who is frequently considered the Sigmund Freud of stigma, 
said that stigma is a Greek word meaning mark, which is the way slave masters used to mark their chattel with a brand on the cheek. And so these marks are usually pretty obvious. And so marks, for example, related to racism or skin color or sexism or body features or ageism or gray hair, pretty much the mark of mental illness is hidden. If I'm in a room with 100 people, I can't tell who has a mental illness. The way you get the mark is with a label. That guy over there is crazy. And the way you get the label is you get seen coming out of a mental health facility. So there's George coming out of the psychiatrist's office. He must be nuts. Nobody wants that label. So people will avoid the label. They won't seek out care. And so a pretty consistent finding in epidemiologic research is almost a half of people with any kind of mental illness won't seek out care. There are real consequences. Well, let me give you another thing if you really want to understand real consequences. A colleague of mine at Emory University named Ben Druss did a study where he went through 20,000 medical records at, at veterans' health authorities, and they looked at veterans who presented with rapid heartbeat, shortness of breath, flushing, such that that person should have been referred to a cardiologist. In 100% of the time, the primary care doctor thought they were just a quote-unquote regular vet, they got referred. In 80% of the time, if the doc thought the person had a substance abuse problem, they got referred. It went down to 40%, or conversely, 60% of veterans who were known to have a mental illness did not get referred. So there's two take-home points here. One is the point is this is an issue of life and death. It's not just that we should be nice and say nice things to people. And two, this is physicians doing this. And these are clearly people who are educated about mental illness. So stigma is really very broad and very potent to this day. Can you talk about the concept of advocates priority and why advocates with lived experience need to lead the effort to end stigma? So I've been supported by the National Institutes of Mental Health for about 20 years working in this, collecting data on what is stigma. And when you talk to advocates, when you talk to people with lived experience, they're, they're quite blunt. They don't really want to know what it is and whether it exists. They know it's out there. They want to know how to fix it. And so the advocate's priority, the advocate's agenda is how do you get rid of stigma so that I have opportunities in life that I'm due so I shouldn't have to feel ashamed for myself. Why do you believe both education and contact with members of stigmatized groups are critical to reducing stigma? Well, actually, I probably don't believe education has much benefit. In fact, the research we've been doing over the last 20 years suggests the contrary, which is ironic because the first set of studies we did, we would present a group of people evidence that mental illness was a brain disorder, show them PET scans where the occipital lobes were lit up because a person with schizophrenia was seeing things. And what you found is, lo and behold, you're less likely to blame them for their mental illness, but you're also less likely to believe they're going to get better. You tend to endorse a bad prognosis. They look good, but they can flip out at any moment. And the degree to which you believe people will not recover is a degree to which an employer is not likely to hire somebody with mental illness or a landlord to rent to them or a teacher providing appropriate care. The alternative, the one that clearly rises to the top, is contact. Contact and social psych came out by a guy named Gordon Allport in the 50s, who said that perhaps the best way we change attitudes between a white majority and a black minority is a degree to which the two interact as peers. So similarly, research we've done and others shows that any kind of facilitated interaction as peers between somebody with mental illness and the rest of the population can decrease stigma. Now, again, remember I said the mark of mental illness is fundamentally hidden. And so if you want a metaphor for understanding how to beat the stigma of mental illness, you should look at the experiences of stigma of the LGBTQ community. Now, let me first be quite clear. I am absolutely not saying LGBTQ is a mental illness. In fact, if psychiatry ever has a badge of shame, that might be one of them. But like mental illness, gay people can hide it. And one of the reasons why we made great leaps against homophobia is because 30, 40, or 50 years ago, brave gay men and women came out and shared their story such that by the time my kids got in school, they escaped homophobia because they knew they had two gay uncles or a gay minister 
or gay family friends, or they had these cool rainbow flags all over the place. So similarly, the degree to which people with mental illness come out and tell their story of recovery is pretty much the most effective way of changing stigma. And that makes stigma change a grassroots issue. I'm a white male. I'm all for black rights, but my role in that is as an ally sitting in the back seat supporting the agenda. Similarly, in terms of mental illness, individuals with lived experience should be leading the charge. Everybody else should be our supportive allies, including, by the way, doctors. Going back to the issue of violence, is someone with a mental illness more violent than the average person? So it's really complex. The National Institute of Mental Health supports these huge epidemiologic studies that are five to 10 years. And we went back and looked at the data of people with different diagnoses and degree to which they report violence. And in fact, people with schizophrenia might report violence more than quote unquote rest of the population. However, two things about data. One is if you're looking at the same data set, you're looking at a room of a hundred people, the best predictor of who's violent in the room is not mental illness. The best predictor is gender whether they're a man. And the other best predictor is young. So young men are about 15 times more violent than the quote-unquote rest of the population, whereas people with mental illness may be about half again as much. So the other point to that is we grossly overestimate the degree to which people are violent. One of the reasons we do that, probably especially unique to the United States, is that every time we have one of these god-awful shootings and we blame it on somebody with mental illness. In fact, I have a colleague, Tony Jorm in Australia, who after the Sandy Hook shooting where those children were killed in Connecticut, they found the stigma of mental illness in Australia got worse. So if we look through a developmental lens, stigma can affect children, adolescents, and adults differently. When should parents and perhaps even school systems begin talking to children and adolescents about the effects of stigma on mental health? So in easy responses earlier, the better. One interesting research tidbit that tends to come out in the literature is there's some thought that discrimination is built into the human psyche so that, for example, research shows young children, white children will look at black children more disdainfully because they're different than we are. It might be built in. And the moment that a child can look at and identify difference is the moment we need to correct that and say difference does not mean bad. Of course, the dilemma with mental illness is the degree to which it's hidden. And the other dilemma with mental illness as a child is trying to sort out what is a quote-unquote mental illness versus what's a behavioral challenge because the child's tantrum. I think all prescriptions for parents with kids, I think you want to be truthful with them, be transparent with them, help them understand the situation, never equate mental illness with shame or pity for that matter. Never say, oh, we should pity that poor guy who's got a problem. The younger, the better. Does stigma manifest itself differently in someone suffering with addictions as opposed to someone with a mental illness like depression? You can look at that from, does the public see people with addictions different than people with mental illness? Yes, we wrote a paper a couple of years ago that said that the double trouble with substance use disorder is that the stigma about it is legally and socially sanctioned. So, for example, unlike mental illness, there are all sorts of laws, and don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily saying these laws are wrong, there are all sorts of laws that criminalize substance use behavior, drinking underage, driving under the influence, many drugs are illegal. Some people really believe the war on drugs that Richard Nixon started exacerbated the whole thing of the stigma of substance use disorder and led to the major problem we have in our criminal system. The other thing is that it's also civilly legal to stigmatize people with substance use disorders. One way, for example, one's substance habits is admissible in court, in tort hearings. Another way, interesting, is the American with Disabilities Act protects a relapse in a person with mental illness so that, for example, if one of your listeners has schizophrenia and has a psychotic break, his or her job protection should stay in place. That is not the case with relapse or drug use. So if somebody is 
trying to manage recovery from opiate use, and they relapse and their job is not protected. So there are different legal standards for substance use disorders versus mental illness. It's also socially sanctioned. There have been in the past these, one of the commercials I remember growing up is somebody cooking an egg. And this is your brain. This is your brain on dope. You don't want to be a bum and end up in the street like the dirty addict. And so there have been public service campaigns. I think people are becoming more aware and trying to tone that down. But there have been public service campaigns to try to prevent substance use by tying it to some kind of disrespected, otherly worldly bum kind of person. So in, in trying to educate the public, they're actually increasing stigma. Right. Are there different levels of stigma within mental health disorders? For example, does someone with an externalizing disorder like oppositional defiance disorder experience stigma differently than someone with a more internalizing disorder such as anxiety? That's a question we've struggled with for a while. If I might frame it another way, you might say think schizophrenia, which is sort of the prototypic bad mental illness, has worse stigma than, for example, bipolar disorder. There's a couple of responses to that. One is there's this nonspecific stigmatizing response to mental illness. I don't care what it is, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, you're nuts. And they all get lumped into the same category and get stigmatized. Leading to the other issue is I often tell people when you're thinking about stigma in terms of mental illness, you have to separate out what the average person on the street understands mental illness versus, for example, what listeners who are mental health professionals might look at it. I'm not sure the average person understands exactly what schizophrenia is. I mean, you hear it's split personality because it's got the schiz word in it. I doubt they could tell you how it's related to schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, mania goes back and forth. So I think in the mental illness category, I just think if you are known to have a mental illness, you're going to get labeled in a really negative way. What role does ethnicity and culture play in understanding stigma? And do you think it is important that mental health clinicians are trained in how to perform a culturally competent assessment before working in the field? So there's a big research interest that comes up in our journal all the time called intersectionality. And one way people typically look at it is that being a black woman is more than being black and being a woman, which are two separate stigmatized conditions. And so putting it alternatively, the stigma of mental illness is a different experience if you're black versus white versus Latinx and the like. So in developing anti-stigma programs, you clearly have to have the community of interest driving that effort, and that would be called community-based participatory research. So we once got support from the Boeing Foundation to look at stigma on the west side of Chicago. On the west side of Chicago is a traditionally African-American community, and I'm a white person, and we put together a steering committee of eight black people. We rooted the whole thing in faith-based community there to develop some sense of how do faith-based African-Americans understand the issue of mental illness and pursue their goals. Two interesting things we found, granted it's a small study, but two interesting things we found is one is that admitting to mental illness is letting your church community down. Because if your church community, if your faith, if your God were doing what it's supposed to do, you wouldn't have mental illness. And we thought the other thing that was interesting was that going to therapy is what Oprah does. The average African-American doesn't do that kind of thing. So that we actually produced an anti-stigma program after that where I would go around with, with black ministers and we would kind of bastardize the New Testament going with give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to Jesus what's his. Or more importantly, go to the minister with your spiritual issues, seek out a mental health care provider for your mental health issues. Should health care providers be culturally competent? Absolutely. Again, I'm old enough to remember that everything I learned in school, I thought applied to everybody. I thought you'd go do CBT and everyone. The issue is that people come from very different cultural perspectives. I should be humble enough to recognize that, have my ears open to listen to them and be prepared to adapt any of my hard and true ways of pursuing care so it reflects where they're at. Talk about clinician bias, because I think oftentimes we clinicians have to really recognize our bias in diagnosing as well. Well, two responses to that. One is research pretty consistently shows the most stigmatizing profession among psychiatrists, plumbers, 
carpenters, cab drivers. The most stigmatizing profession is psychiatrists, with the second one being psychologists and social workers right behind them. And the reason for that mostly is especially psychiatrists tend to see people when they're only really sick. And so they kind of reduce people down. They're having a psychotic, psychotic break, forgetting that the rule is recovery is a rule that everybody gets to a point where they should be hopeful and get back to pursuing whatever goals to define who they are. Which leads to the second issue, which is diagnosis by itself can be a very stigmatizing event. One of the things I always teach my students about the risk for the DSM is you sit down with a person who's seeking out help for you and they speak to you for an hour with their complex story and you reduce everything they said down to four words. I mean, I suppose we have to do that to get insurance payments, but it does not at all help us understand who this complex, interesting individual is in front of me. You developed a program called Honest, Open, and Proud. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So as I said, contact is probably one of the best ways to get rid of public stigma, the degree to which the quote-unquote average person interacts with somebody in recovery. But there's another issue with stigma, which is a shame people feel, which frequently drives them into the closet. And so some sense of disclosing of coming out can really help them deal with that stigma. And we developed a program called Honest Open Proud. It's been around for about 10 years now to help people strategically decide whether they want to disclose. Now, let me be clear. We are by no means telling anybody to naively come out and tell everyone that they have a mental illness. Honest Open Proud is traditionally done by two trained facilitators with lived experience with usually eight to 10 peers in a group. It's three lessons. The first lesson is to consider the pros and cons of disclosing, which, by the way, vary depending on whether you're disclosing at work versus a faith-based community versus your family at the holidays. And the second issue is how to disclose in a relatively safe manner. So you, for example, seem to be a nice person. I could take you to Starbucks and I could say, hey, did you see Silver Linings Playbook? It's this movie about a guy who's got bipolar disorder. What do you think? And if you said, I'm sick and tired of those Hollywood BS showing people mental illness is okay, I see you're not a good person to disclose to. And the third lesson is it's your story. What are you going to say? Again, at heart, we're researchers. At this point, there have been five randomized controlled trials in the research literature on it. To summarize, it has positive effects. One of the interesting effects is that follow-up a month later, maybe at best 20% of people have disclosed. However, it has huge impacts on self-esteem, recovery, and depression, because whether people disclose or not, now they realize they have the power to decide. And so we think programs like Honest, Open, Proud is one way to deal with self-stigma. The other benefit, again, is remember the more of us who are out, the more of us who are living witness to the recovery of mental illness. And the same fact that the more LGBTQ community folks came out, the more we tore down homophobia. So what are the consequences of not addressing stigma? I think you look at it two ways. One is the injustice it bestows on its victims. And so now sitting where we're at now, looking back at American history, the huge injustice we did to people of color by robbing them of their rights to vote, to work, to live where they want was wrong. And so we addressed racism. Don't get me wrong, we have a long way to go. We addressed racism head on by saying that kind of thing is wrong, that a black person is a wholly esteemed person like everyone else. Similarly, adjusting the stigma of mental illness is trying to wrong that injustice. The other big problem with stigma mental illness is the rest of society. Whenever you alienate, disenfranchise a group of people, the society is losing an important resource. And actually, when you think about it, people with mental illness are not a small group of people. Population research suggests the LGBTQ community might be somewhere between 10 and 12 percent. Lifetime prevalence of a serious mental illness is about 20 to 25 percent. So there's a lot of people out there with a serious mental illness. The more those people feel like they don't have to be ashamed of themselves in the closet, the more they feel like they can be full members and, and fully embrace life, the more not only their life will benefit, but so will society. Do you think stigma is worse for one ethnicity or culture over another? 
Well, I'm privileged to have several international students. And so I have one student, Amir, who just did a study on stigma, Pakistanis living in the United States, and another one, Benoit, who did a study on Indians living in the United States. And I definitely think there's unique challenges for everybody. I mean, part of the challenge of dealing with stigma and being from a different country is also the struggle of acculturation. That said, I'm not sure I ever want to say stigma is worse in one culture than another. Because at the end of the day, while it might be bad for the Indian family, it can be pretty bad for the Irish American family too. And I think trying to say one is worse than the other is just not fit. That also said, though, it's clear that if we're going to help Benoit deal with the stigma of Indians, then he and a group of Indians living in America need to form the team who make the decisions how to do that. So what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? Peers. <laughs> I'm actually finishing up a book on the vision of peer services in the mental health profession. Peers is actually a grassroots idea that came out separately from the professions. It reflects the whole notion of recovery. When I was in school, I learned that diagnoses like schizophrenia were kiss of death, that you were doomed. But the best thing I could do for a patient with schizophrenia is talk them into living on the inpatient unit and rocking in a chair the rest of their life. And I robbed them of any sense of hope because the research shows that people with schizophrenia can do quite well. I mean, in some ways, it's similar to people with paraplegia or quadriplegia. They have huge disorders abilities to deal with. But to tell them that their life is done and they shouldn't pursue any kind of goals they have is robbing them of a future. Peers are people with lived experience who have been there, who knows what it likes to be robbed of that sort of thing and want to promote recovery. And so in the last few years, and the mental health system more and more has started to gravitate towards hiring people with lived experience to provide services. One of the big providers of that is the Veterans Administration. They hire veterans with a history of serious mental illness to provide services to other veterans who are currently struggling with mental health. What might they do? Well, the best way to get people back to work is get them a job coach a person who helps them get the job, then goes to the work every day, sees how they are. If the person talks to their supervisor, does some brainstorming about how they're going to get through, maybe some stress reduction sort of things, peers can be job coaches. The best way to keep people in housing is to get them a housing coach. Same thing. Uh, peers can be housing coaches. So a lot of the frontline, most effective ways of helping people with serious mental illness meet their goals can be done by peers. And it's slowly more and more growing as a force in the American mental health workforce. So if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? More peers. <laughs> <laughs> I need to put this in perspective, hesitate to say this, because my I say this to my students all the time. I teach masters and doctoral students in rehab counseling, and I'm really a big believer in peer services. And so I say to them, well, what the heck do you have to go to school for two to five years for? I mean, you just go and provide peer services. And if you're not a peer, you're not needed. I don't think that's so. I do think there are some therapies that require a higher level of practice and skill, cognitive behavior therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, all require a special commitment to learning those kind of things. And people with masters and doctorates may have a special role for that. But again, I think a lot of what can be done to help people get back to work or live on their own and get through school can all be done with trained, supervised peers who are working in a mental health system. So how can my audience learn more about your work, either online or in print? In print, they can go to Amazon, type in my name, and get hit with about 19 books. I have one coming out in peer services by Nova Science in the next year. Perhaps the best book written for a lay public on stigma is called The Stigma Effect, which came out through Columbia University Press last year. That's written for a popular audience about what are some unintended consequences of stigma and ways to deal with it. Web addresses, if you want to learn more about the Honest Open Proud program, you can go to www.hopprogram.org 
You'll find the program there, which can be downloaded for free. Contact me if you want to talk more. Our research can be understood by going to the website for the National Consortium on Stigma and Empowerment, which is ncse1.org. And I do this as a life's avocation. Email me, corrigan at iit.edu, and I'd be glad to get in the discussion with you. That's so generous. Thank you so much. So Dr. Corrigan, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people you have helped your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the field of stigma and mental health. Well, thank you for having me. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. 